You're listening to The Catherine Zox Show. If you'd like to join our conversation this morning, call now. The toll-free number is 866-472-5788. That number again is 866-472-5788. We're back. I'm Catherine Zox, your social worker with a microphone, and you're listening to The Catherine Zox Show on VoiceAmericaVariety.com and World Talk Radio. Joining me this morning is Dr. Lyle Back. Uh, Our topic this morning is 10 Shades of Grey, Secrets Most Plastic Surgeons Will Never Reveal. Uh, Dr. Beck is a plastic surgeon himself. He is a Philadelphia Area Board Certified Plastic Surgeon uh, who's not afraid to pull back the proverbial surgical curtain to give lay people the real reality of cosmetic surgery. Um, He has been in private practice for over 20 years. Uh, He specializes in the full range of the most modern and state-of-the-art cosmetic surgery procedures and non-surgical cosmetic enhancement techniques available today. Uh, He's also performed reconstructive surgery and Operation Smile in Vietnam. Welcome to the show. Nice to have you on this morning, Dr. Back. Catherine, thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. Okay, so you're a plastic surgeon, but now you're kind of like uh, the truth teller in terms of what does plastic surgery really mean? And I just before we got on the show, I told you I'm in Miami and I've seen a lot. I've seen a lot of ladies who obviously have had plastic surgery, but also men as well. So what are some of the secrets behind plastic surgery? It's not so simple. You get your nose done, you get a tummy tuck, you get the cellulite thing, and then you look gorgeous and everything is fine. Not true. No, it's (laughs) it's not really true. You know, this is plastic surgery has at its heart, it's a serious business. And uh, we're dealing with uh, medical issues, health issues, surgical issues, uh, some real uh, health considerations that have to be taken into account. Of course, those kinds of things don't get played up in the media and uh, culturally we like to think of plastic surgery as kind of having a lot of pizzazz and sizzle and it's kind of fun and people like to talk about it. It's involved with our celebrities and so forth. But there are some true, you know, serious hard facts that people need to know about. We don't want to scare people and we don't want to make people think, oh my God, this is, this is, this is really tough stuff here. But by the same token, um, there's a, there's an undermining of the true medical natures uh, that gets perpetuated a little bit with the, uh, uh, you know, sort of the show business side of it all. And uh, I think it's important for a plastic surgeon to reel that in a little bit. Maybe not, you know, in a, in a, in a, uh, in a confronting way or in a mean way or in an overly serious or somber way. But nevertheless, I think it's important for patients to understand that there are some serious things that they need to know about. Dr. Beck, why do you think that most plastic surgeons well, don't reveal those things because they want more business. They just want, you know, they want their practice to, to grow and thrive. And, and so they don't really want to tell you or help you to make an informed decision about whether or not, you know, you want to have this the procedure done or um, what's the reason behind it for not really kind of revealing the truth behind uh, having plastic surgery or what the ramifications can be? Well, I don't, I don't think any plastic surgeon wants to withhold information that would make an informed consent uh, a compromise, and I don't think that's happening. But I do think that there is a bias and there is a tendency to sort of maybe overemphasize the, the nicer sides and the pizzazz sides and kind of uh, soft pedal, uh, you know, the more serious medical sides. Even some of the names we use for procedures uh, take away a little bit from their seriousness. For example, one of the one of the biggest operations we do, it's probably one of the most serious, and I would dare say it may be the biggest operations most cosmetic surgeons do is called a tummy tuck. But if you hear the name tummy tuck, it sounds like you go in for about 10 minutes and you come out looking great. That's not to say it's not a fantastic operation and people benefit greatly from it, but, but it has some serious things that need to be discussed. I do think the the tendency toward uh, wanting to have a thriving practice and a busy practice does create a uh, a little bit of a bias to maybe you know not be so overt in discussing these things. I do but, think, though, eventually, in one way or another, they do get discussed. Uh, I, I would never consider that a, uh, an ethical board-certified plastic surgeon would not make these things apparent uh, to a prospective patient. Uh, but perhaps not so much up front, maybe, as as would be ideal, perhaps. So ideally, I, what I hear you saying is 
have real realistic expectations. Have the conversation with your doctor. Be a real realistic. Tummy tuck does sound like kind of like you know yeah right you know tummy tuck easy, uh, not a big uh, surgical procedure necessarily. But as you mentioned, uh, you're going to have discomfort. You're going to have dis pain. If you talk about it beforehand, then the patient isn't going to be as disgruntled afterwards either because they are going to be in pain. But if you expect to be in pain for a certain amount of time, uh, things are going to go more smoothly, it would seem to me, than if you Absolutely. thought. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I, I completely agree with that. I think the more information you have beforehand and the more realistic and honest that information, uh, the greater your ability to process it and deal with it. And also there's the trust factor that when your doctor says, look, this is going to hurt. Um, you can, you're prepared for that, but you also know that when he says this isn't going to hurt, that you can trust that, that he's, that he's a, you know, a reliable guy that, that is a straight shooter with you. Yeah, I always respect my doctor. I'm not necessarily cosmetic surgery because I haven't had that yet, but uh, you know, you're going to have pain. We go, you know, one to 10, is it going to be a five or a six? How long is it going to last? You know, on the average, uh, that's so much more helpful uh, than just sort of being told everything's going to be fine. And because uh, that's really, I mean, it may be fine, but there's a whole procedure you have to go through. You talk about, and this is a big one, well, bad scarring, because that is an issue, I guess, with cosmetic surgery. And I, it, and, Absolutely. Yeah. Is it you know, some, um, yeah, go ahead. You, you see a plastic surgeon, you go to a cosmetic surgeon, and of course you should have an expectation that this guy is a master in hiding scars, minimizing scars, making them as invisible, you know, as possible. Uh, that's our that's our field. That's our expertise. We're supposed to be the best at scars of anybody that there is. But we get bad scars too, and that's because a lot of what happens in the in the process of healing is really not as much in the control of your plastic surgeon as you would like to believe. Genetics play a big factor. Uh, individual uh, uh, an individual's per, a person's Tendency towards scarring or not scarring, big factor. The operation itself, the length of the scar, the location of the scar, all these things play a role. And of course, as a board-certified plastic surgeon with, with a lot of experience, your doctor is, is going to use every technique, skill, trick, uh, nuance that he can to minimize your scars. But having a realistic uh, approach and a realistic view of this you have to realize as a patient, sometimes things don't work out exactly as we hope, and sometimes there is a scar that's not the way we like. And um, I think you have to go into an operation expecting, you know, there's a possibility, however slim, that that could happen. And um, to not have that perception perhaps goes along with some of the other things that we talked about, about not really having a true appreciation for, for some of the serious aspects that are involved in, in these types of procedures. What about in terms of the individual patient aging? Is do older patients tend to scar more than younger patients? Do they heal faster, or is that not a piece of the puzzle? You know, age doesn't really pay play a role. Um, it, it really depends on the person. There are people uh, up in the years who are extremely healthy, who heal well, heal beautifully, uh, and unfortunately, there are younger people that are the exact opposite of that. It really has to do with the individual's physiology, um, and really their their overall health and uh, response to to surgery. Um, I, I don't. I think age is not really a factor. Uh, can you hear me? I'm losing you a bit. Oh yeah, I can hear you. I'm sorry. Okay, good. No, that's okay. The next thing that I was shocked, I have to say, because I didn't realize you still use this as, as surgeons, as plastic surgeons, but leeches. You you mentioned that you have a secret weapon that you use when things go wrong, and they are leeches? Yes. They're <laughs> still a very, very important tool to plastic surgeons and have been for many years. So how does that work? What do you do with the leeches? Well, don't say it with such disdain in your voice. <laughs> the leeches, leeches have a bad rap. They need yeah. better PR. Okay, uh, you know, so here's your chance. Give it to us. Okay, I'm going to tell you that they are yeah. beautiful creatures. They are amazing creatures uh, that are, are truly beautifully uh, designed in what they do and how they do. And I'll tell you why they're so important, especially for reconstructive surgeons. You've, you've seen a lot of the news lately about uh, people getting entire face transplants. And, of course, there are hand transplants now. 
and uh, they're working on feet and legs. Uh, but for many years, we've been putting back, because of traumatic uh, incidents, people's ears and fingers. Sometimes during these operations, which can be very long, and of course the stakes are quite high, the blood flow through the reattached part becomes very sluggish. It's, it's sort of a side effect of the, of the whole process. And what, a, what leeches can do is that if the blood flow becomes dangerously low and the reattached part, which, by the way, also could be in a, in a breast reconstruction where tissues are moved from one part of the body to reconstruct the breast loss to cancer, uh, the leeches are able to draw out some of this blood in a way that sort of gets the uh, engine started, sort of gets the blood moving again. And after a short application of, of the leeches to to draw off some of this blood in a very gentle and a very innocuous way, uh, the entire reconstruction can be salvaged. And that could be, you know, a finger or, a, or, or really even an entire uh, reconstructed face. Uh, the leeches are um, very, very good at doing their job. They have a tiny amount of little anesthetic uh, that when they attach, so there's no pain. Um, and for each of them, the amount of uh, sluggish blood or clotted blood that they can draw off. It comes off very, very quickly and in a timely fashion, and then they can be gently removed. Uh, it, they, they are amazing, beautiful creatures. And uh, when I was doing reconstructive surgery as a major part of my practice, uh, I carried the toll-free number to call Leeches USA in my wallet so that in any given week or month, that, uh, should the time arise, I pulled that card out and, and had my leeches in, in under a, a few hours. Well, that's amazing. And I guess now all I'm thinking about the, what, the doctors, was it the 19th century when they were using leeches uh, well, to... Yeah, yeah. You know, way back, yeah, way back when, I, I, I'm thinking probably it even goes back to the time when they were doing things in the medieval ages like cupping, where there was a belief that by, you know, drawing off the, the evil humors and, and the, the negative uh, energies and so forth that were inside the body that you could cure. Um, I don't know how true that, that was or is, uh, but we definitely know that uh, by reestablishing blood flow, we can salvage an entire reconstructive operation in a way that no medication and no surgical technique can duplicate. Uh, that I mean, I I had no idea, and I'm sure a lot of my listeners didn't either. But as you know, if they want, did you say Leeches USA is the uh, a, a website that you can go to if you want to? Yes, learn? they're yeah. they're in West they're in Westbury, New York, and they've been around for a long, long time. And they've been quietly helping plastic surgeons for many, many years save many, many a patient a lot of heartache. All right. Now we're going to switch to cellulite because cellulite, which is, I would say, the majority of my friends, girlfriends, are always complaining about cellulite. But there's not really, according to you, real good news about fixing cellulite. Well, there's, there's a couple of things about cellulite that bother me. One is... As you pointed out, this is a condition, it probably affects, I don't know, maybe 80 to 90% of adult women in the United States. And you know there's still, despite that, controversy and some sort of discussion in the medical community as to whether or not it's even real. Uh, I recently uh, just did a quick spot check at uh, WebMD and saw that the very first thing they said about cellulite was, boy, gee, you, you would think it's a serious condition with such a serious-sounding medical name. And I thought, well, what, what, an, insulting, <laughs> what an insulting thing to say. You've got literally tens of millions, maybe hundreds of millions of dollars being spent every year by women all across the world on a condition that the medical community is saying, gee, we're not really sure if it exists. Well, let me tell you, it, it absolutely exists. It's absolutely real. And it's a very, very, uh, you know, sort of, disturbing and troublesome problem. Um, and, you know, like all things, first, you have to respect the problem. You have to identify that it's real before you can really make some good inroads. And I, I suspect that this is still a little bit of a problem. It's getting the, the, the diagnosis is get, still getting a little bit of a bum's rush and not really getting the, the attention it really deserves. And that leaves it to the charlatans to step into that power vacuum and say, hey, Guess what? We take it serious, and look at this cream we have. So, you know, there's, I think, you know, probably hundreds of potentially uh, useless, I'd say mostly useless, uh, cellulite uh, types of treatments. There are a lot of things, though, that work 
temporarily. And that's because one of the things that can help cellulite look better is the massaging of the tissues to sort of rearrange the lumpy fat under the skin and decreasing the amount of fluid in the skin. So any treatment that does that will quote unquote work. We have a few things in the, that are sort of circulating around. Some of them work sort of okay. I have a difficulty with some of these techniques because they are being promoted to the public as being sort of non-invasive or minim minimally invasive treatments, but they're really not. They're invasive. I mean, if you're making a cut in someone's skin and threading a laser wire underneath their skin, that's not minimally, minimally invasive to me. Um, but, but there are some techniques that are showing some promise, and one of my favorites right now, uh, because of the science behind it, is a treatment called Verju, V-E-R-J-U. Uh, which is a special green light laser that I'm really excited about. And, and I, I, it, it does such amazing things that I, I almost can't believe that it really works. But it's, it's, it's an amazing technology that I think is actually going to open a lot of doors to um, sort of a, a new, whole new area of investigation into, into how lasers can work on the body. It's, it's quite fascinating. How long will it last, or how long does it last once you've had the procedure? What are we talking well, you know, about? Yeah. yeah, you know, like, this is, this is actually another one of those ten shades of gray secrets, which is really the bigger question, which is how long does anything last that we do? Um, there are some treatments that are temporary. This one is not. But really, all the treatments we do are not going to last forever. No matter how much liposuction we do, if someone's diet isn't so good or their activity level isn't so good or if they're on a medication that causes them to tend to gain weight, you know, things are going to change. Even this treatment, the Verjoux Green Light Laser, although it causes the fat cells to empty, improving the look of cellulite and actually diminishing inches off the hips or the stomach, uh, you know, with time, given the right set of circumstances, these things can come back. Unfortunately, I, I, I can turn back the clock and I can make people thinner and I can get rid of cellulite and I can lift things and tighten things. And, but, you know, I can't stop time. Time moves on and things change. So we just hope that people can get a, a nice run out of whatever we do. And most of the time they do. Well, you just mentioned something that I think is really important. You can all, you do what you do, but the individual, the patient, the client, they they have to do to do uh, uh, they have to do their part as well. It, you know, you do the surgery, let's say, or uh, talking about maybe facelifts, which I think you had said they say they last on an average of ten years, but you have to eat well and sleep well and take care of yourself and maintain your weight and do all the things that are going to enhance the procedure. And if you don't do that, it would seem to me, or that's what I hear you saying, is that, you know what, it may not last as long or it's not going to work as well. So it's kind of, you know, you have to work with the surgery. The patient does as well. Of course. And, you know, and sometimes it's not really like, we don't want to put blame there. You know, it's not your fault. Yeah. You, could have a, you, could, you could develop a medical condition that has as a side effect weight gain. You could be on a, you could be on a type of medication uh, that drops your metabolism down. Uh, I mean, these, these things happen. But, you know, it's funny. People will go to the gym and diet, work out like crazy, get, get thin, get slender, get in shape, and they would never think for a minute, okay, well, now that I've gotten the body of my dreams, I can just do whatever I want because it's going to stay like that forever without me doing a thing. No one would ever think that. That would be ridiculous. But unfortunately, I think sometimes people think that a little bit about cosmetic surgery. But it's no different. You know, it's really no different. What about people's skin tone is different, like uh, elasticity, for example. Are there any, any times when a, uh, a patient will come in and want to have a facelift and you would be able to... Uh, you kind of ascertain that, you know, this, there's the skin, the elast elasticity wasn't good, and that you would recommend not having a facelift, say, for that reason? Well, I don't know that I would recommend not having a facelift for that reason. I think I would still be able to do them a lot of good. But what I would explain to the person is that when you have a inherent diminished elasticity in your skin, it ultimately is going to affect the degree to which that skin will stay up, stay tight, or look as firm or as pulled as one might want. So whether it's a facelift or a tummy tuck or a breast lift or something like that, what I would explain to the person is, is that there are things about them 
in their skin and the way their skin will respond that might not really enable us to get them the result that, you know, maybe they were shooting for. So maybe we can't get the A+, plus, but we'll get like an A-, minus or maybe a B+. Plus. That doesn't mean it will be bad. It just makes the patient my partner in this, understanding that we're kind of dealing with a situation uh, that puts a tiny amount of compromise in what we could expect. Nevertheless, it's still going to be a significant improvement and uh, just puts us on the same page about realistic expectations, and that's very important. Yeah, I think that's key, and I think uh, there are a couple more. We only have a couple more minutes, but so I just want to go over these quickly. But one of the things that you say, it's better to have elective surgery, elective surgery early in the week. Why? Well, you know, for a lot of patients, um, their doctors uh, may or may not be so available. Uh, medical facilities, one or another, might be uh, closed or have limited hours. If you have a surgery earlier in the week, you've got a doctor's office that's going to be open all week, the doctor's probably going to be more available, and the facilities certainly are going to have more, uh, more wide range of availability for hours should something be necessary. No one wants to have a problem or an emergency or, 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 or a, a troublesome situation that needs to be dealt with that's now complicated by the fact that you can't get a hold of the doctor, the facility's closed, the office is closed, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. I'm not and saying I think that the that other happens. thing you, I'm interrupting you because we were, we have yeah. a time problem here, but because the last two things you talk about being honest, the doctor has to be honest and the patient has to be honest. Doctor, if you're, I mean, the patient must, if you've had previous surgery, you say, tell your doctor, be honest about it. Uh, because he has to know what's gone and has to have the, the, the correct history. And then, the doctor, in terms of being honest, asked them about their complication rates. I think that was a really interesting, we're gonna, I'd like to end with that one because a, a doctor who, anybody who has been practicing surgery for a period of time is going to have had some complications, am I right? Absolutely, and, and you know, it sounds like a strange thing to say, but wouldn't you want to have a doctor who has actually faced problems and faced complications and therefore has an ability to be able to deal with them? Um, no one wants to have a physician say, gee, I've never seen this before. I mean, you, you, you want to have a guy who knows how to do everything to take care of you. And that includes taking care of things when they go wrong. And sometimes they do go wrong. They exactly. say that that's the real mark of an expert is the guy who not only knows how to do things right, but knows how to fix them when they go wrong. And you are the expert. And we have to say goodbye. It's Dr. Lyle Back. Topic today has been 10 Shades of Grey, Secrets Most Plastic Surgeons Will Never Reveal. And it's uh, L Lovely or L Love Lyleback.com is the website you can go to. Thanks so much for being on the show this morning. Thank you so much, Catherine. Yeah. It's actually www.ilovelyleback.com. Oh, okay. I love Thank you. All right. We're going to say Thank goodbye. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm Catherine Zox, your social worker with a microphone, and you've been listening to The Catherine Zox Show on VoiceAmericaVariety.com and World Talk Radio. Have a great week, and we'll see you next Wednesday. We hope you've enjoyed today's episode of The Catherine Zox Show. You can listen live every Thursday morning at 7 a.m. Pacific Time on The Voice America channel. Want to know more about Catherine? Visit her website at www.catherinezox.com. Be sure to join us next week for more interviews and great conversations with Catherine Zox.